and welcome to section three of the uh, chapter 25, the America moves to the city. Uh, this is an AP U.S. history video or a dual enrollment video or U.S. history. Uh, we're looking at the section on the lust for learning to the new morality. Uh, so a lot of changes going on in the late 1800s uh, in the Gilded Age. And so during this time period, public education and the idea of tax-supported elementary schools and high schools gain support. More and more people are going to schools. More and more communities are funding schools. Uh, most Americans had four years of schooling in 1865. Ooh. <laughs> Fourth grade education, let's go. Uh, by 1914, 80% of kids were enrolled in, in school, which is a big deal because, you know, kids could go work back then and make lots, not lots, but they can make some money. Uh, by 1900, there were 6,000 high schools across the country. Uh, high schools were predominantly for, for girls back then. Most men, when they reached eighth grade, if they made it that far, went and got a job. Uh, to help pay wages or move out on their own. Uh, and so the modern high school is not really coming into being yet. Uh, so like I said, mainly girls attended. Kindergartens, that German import, uh, the Garten for the little kids, yeah, the kindergartens, uh, grew in popularity as well. Kind of, you know, starting school before school. Uh, and so then also, you know, teachers, if more people are going to school, teachers need to be trained. Uh, and so teacher training schools popped up. They're called normal schools that grew across the nation. Uh, you also have the development of the private Catholic parochial schools, uh, which helped immigrant children re receive a non-Protestant education. Uh, so you get a lot of Catholic schools popping up across the countries. Uh, and then there's this Chautauqua movement across the nation, uh, which helped Amer uh, adults gain education. This is a picture of uh, Chautauqua at the Silt Historical Society. It's usually held in May. Um, they kind of taught practical things, you know, how to churn butter, how to bridle your horse, I don't know, things that helped adults back then. Uh, crowded cities generally provided better education facilities. Uh, out in the rural areas, you had a one-room schoolhouse where kids, you know, was five, six, seven grades in one, in one building, uh, learning the same things at the same, or not the same things, that'd be really hard, but learning different things at the same time. Uh, and the United States' literacy rate rose from 80% in 19, 1870 uh, to 89% in 1900. That's that's pretty good. Uh, still got some progress to go there, America. Let's go. Um, two um, prominent African Americans uh, who helped change uh, black education were Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, we're going to learn a little bit about each one of them here in a second. They had vastly different views on, on how African Americans could achieve equality. The South lagged behind other regions in public education. African Americans suffered the most. Um, separate but equal because of Plessy versus Ferguson. Uh, there were black schools and there were white schools. Uh, and so oftentimes they were not equal. They were not funded equally at all. Uh, and so black schools lagged behind uh, in terms of materials and buildings and, and you know even just money to operate. Uh, Booker T. Washington founded the Tuskegee Institute to try to change that. Um, he thought that African Americans should learn practical skills, trade skills, uh, and from that they could make a, a little bit of money, they could achieve some economic equality, and then slowly over time by ch achieving economic equality, they could maybe achieve political equality and societal equality down the road. Uh, Washington focused on an e economic equality, like I said, instead of social equality. Uh, his star pupil was George Washington Carver, pictured in the lower right there. Uh, this is him with my little pointer. Uh, he taught and researched at the Tuskegee Institute in 1896. Uh, most people know him as the inventor of peanut butter. That's what he's accredited with. Uh, he did a lot more than that. A lot of work with peanuts. Um, thought that that would be a miracle crop for the South. It would save the soil, provide a uh, valuable food stuff. And then you could make things. They even made engines that ran on peanut oil. You name it, that guy did a lot. So he became international fam famous for his agricultural chemist. Uh, he really was a proponent of peanuts, uh, sweet potatoes, and soy, which those are all superfoods now. All the people that are really super healthy, unlike me, uh, they love to eat those, and you should, probably should too, and not eat as much bacon. But bacon tastes good. So moving on. Uh, Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois uh, attacked Washington because Washington condemned the black race to manual labor and perpetual inferiority. That basically... Yeah, having a trade is nice, but they're still, it's too slow. Uh, he thought that there was the uh, talented 10%, that, that the really, really smart and gifted 10% of African Americans should have equality immediately. He was the first black to graduate from Harvard University. And so this is his talented 10th that should have full and immediate equality. Uh, du Bois is very famous because he helped form 
the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, uh, the legal arm eventually of the civil rights movement, one of the most uh, famous and well-known civil rights groups still around today in the United States. Uh, he helped found that in 1910. So uh, we'll come back to this later in chapters. These are kind of the seeds of the civil rights movement being sowed here uh, by prominent African Americans. In terms of education going further and higher education, female and black colleges also arose after the Civil War. Uh, you have the creation of Vassar and Mount Holyoke, which were women's colleges in the Northeast. Uh, you have Hampton University, which educated African Americans and Native Americans in Atlanta. Uh, Howard helped blacks as well in D.C. It's still one of the most renowned, predominantly African American schools in the United States. Uh, and then importantly, the Morrill Act in 1862 allowed land-grant colleges. This was something, one of those bills that was passed during the Civil War without the South being there. It was easier to pass. So they couldn't vote against it. Uh, and so it allowed the state governments to use uh, property taxes and other uh, funding to basically fund higher education as a public school. Uh, the Hatch Act of 1887 extended and funded it further. And so the birth of the public university was really credited to the Morrill Act, not private institutions like Harvard and Yale and all that. Uh, you have my alma mater in the picture here. Um, when I went there, it was called Mesa State College. Now it's Colorado Mesa University. Uh, go Mavs. Uh, there's over 100 colleges founded from these bills here. Uh, millionaires and tycoons donated generously to the education system. We've talked previously about Vanderbilt University and Duke University uh, and others like that. Stanford, we're going to get to here in a second. Uh, you have Cornell, you have Stanford, Duke, Vanderbilt, University of Chicago, founded by a little rich guy named John D. Rockefeller. might have heard of him. He's got a little bit of money. You have Johns Hopkins University, founded in 1876. Uh, it was the first nation's first high-grade graduate school, one of the most renowned schools for medical doctors uh, and, and doctorships in the nation still today. Uh, so this is showing the education levels from 1870 to 2010, the number of Americans graduating from high school and also college uh, just soared, soared over the centuries. Uh, there's a lot of other factors going into this, uh, but in 2010 it's estimated that nearly 3.3 million Americans graduated from high school, 1.65 million Americans graduated from college, uh, and then we have the median number of years school completed. Uh, and the number of, you know, the graduation percentage, the number of graduates, 17-year-olds uh, that graduated high school, 1872%. Uh, you fast forward to 2010, it's estimated that 82% of Americans at the 17-year-old population are high school graduates. It's pretty good. Maybe 18, I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe that's why the percentage is low. Uh, this is a nice picture of the construction of Stanford University. Beautiful campus. Uh, the private ranch of the Stanford family that made a fortune in the railroad business. Uh, Leland Stanford and his wife, their son died uh, as a teenager collecting art in Italy. Uh, and so they adopted the children of California as their own and built Stanford University. Uh, here's a picture just from a couple years ago. Uh, I went to the Gilda Lerman Institute there. Uh, beautiful school, beautiful campus, hardest school in America to get into, but boy, it's gorgeous. So the March of the Mind. Uh, specialization, not synthesis, the classics. Uh, became the goal of, of college education, that basically you specialized, you had a major, uh, you studied something that interested you, and you would go into a work that, and you wouldn't just, you know, study and memorize the classics and, you know, quote Cicero and all that stuff. Uh, electives became popular, uh, schools were more secularized now than as religious, uh, public health increased due to, to scientific advancements, there's more of an emphasis on science, uh, and so they're learning that for one, washing your hands before you cook food is probably important. It doesn't. It helps you know kill germs and doesn't get people sick. Uh, William James founded the first psych lab, psychology lab in Harvard in 1879. Uh, William James, kind of a more of a philosopher, but studied a little bit of the mind, the structure of the mind, and how it evolved and what was useful and what wasn't. Uh, he helped found the pragmatism movement in philosophy. Uh, he thought that truth could be tested from its practical consequences, and we have the logo of Harvard here. Um, with all these people learning to read and write, people needed something to read. Uh, the Library of Congress, the world's biggest library, was founded in 1897. Libraries across the country grew in popularity, largely due to Andrew Carnegie's contributions. Um, newspapers were being printed in increased amounts because of the invention of linotype in 1885. Uh, Joseph Pulitzer founded his uh, New York World 
Uh, they had over a million readers daily. William Randolph Hearst had his San Francisco Examiner in the Morning Journal, which became syndicated. Uh, we'll come back to these two quite a bit here in the imperialistic uh, chapter, talking about yellow journalism and some of their sensationalized headlines that they did. Uh, so yellow journalism is trying to sell papers with, oh, you know, attention-grabbing stories and, you know, big news, and it's kind of like the tabloids, actually. Uh, the Associated Press was founded in the 1840s, was gaining strength, strength and wealth. So, so if you're a member of a newspaper of the Associated Press, they can share stories, they can syndicate them, uh, and add more to the local newspaper. It's kind of a cool thing. Magazines also grew in popularity as well. Uh, you have the Atlantic Monthly, Harper's Weekly, Ladies Home Journal. The New York Nation, or The Nation, was founded in 1865 by Edwin Godkin. Push for civil service reform, honesty in government, uh, moderate tariff. And so these magazines are taking more of a stance here. Henry George passed uh, or started Progress and Poverty in 1879, which addressed the Association of Progress with Poverty. He proposed a 100% tax on profits due to increase land value, that basically nobody should make money because of real estate. Just because you lived on it in a certain amount of time, you shouldn't make profit off of that. Uh, Edward Bellamy wrote the socialistic novel Looking Backward, uh, which the book portrayed a time in the future when big businesses uh, were nationalized to serve the public interest. That basically, that if it's too big and too important to society, the government should own and operate it uh, and keep the prices fair. People should be making millions uh, that's something that was essential to living in the United States. The new morality. Victoria Woodhull wrote uh, the periodical The Woodhull and, and Clayton's Weekly in 1872. In it, she proclaimed her belief in free love, that you shouldn't be bound by the contracts of marriage. Free love. Man, that's like way early. We're talking 90 years early. This isn't the 60s. This isn't Woodstock. Uh, but it was out there back in the 1870s. Anthony Comstock helped pass the Comstock Law, which censored immoral material from the public. You can't print smut like this. Free love. That's crazy. Don't do that. Uh, that's all we have for this time. If you have any questions or comments, put them in the comments. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, take care.